Amen. What a beautiful song. Thank you. The scripture passage read this morning is both deep and it's powerful. Some people say that this passage inspired one of the oldest hymns that we can find from this passage in Philippians chapter 2. For our purpose this morning, speaking about the mind of Christ, I'll be uh, talking about two specific themes we can find in this passage, joy and love. Staying in love with God is a choice that we get to make every day. Here in our church, I want to just kind of figure this out. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. I want you to raise your hand if you've been married for at least two months. All right. Nice work. Three months? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll raise the ante a bit. One year. Keep it up. Five? Seven? Nine? Ten? Fifteen? Twenty? Twenty-five? 30, 35, you can see where I'm going, right? 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 64, 65? <laughs> Do I hear 66? 67, 68, 69, 70, 71? All right, Jane, how, how many years are we talking? All right, I wasn't going to go that high, so you win. 85 years, that's wonderful. Now, um, my grandparents were married just over 64 years before my grandfather died about seven years ago. And he always told me and the grocery clerk and um, anybody who would listen to him that the secret to his marriage is simply saying a few words as many times as you could every day. He would say to his wife, thy will be done. <laughs> theological, practical, by the way, that doesn't work for everybody. I tried. <laughs> but this isn't about me. The, la the summer that Lainey and I, my wife, got engaged, we were serving as um, intern pastors at a church in Squim, Washington. They have a beautiful lavender festival every summer. After we got engaged that summer, the children's coordinator of the church that we were serving told us that the secret to her marriage, she'd been married about 27 years or so, um, was that she and her husband found hobbies that they found to enjoy each other. For them, it was tennis. They kind of developed that discipline. It's what kept their marriage exciting and alive. Now, my wife and I often reflect about our time in Squim and recall the wisdom that Peg shared with us. I'm sure if that we polled every couple in our sanctuary and our community, that each of you would have different pearls of wisdom to share about this subject of how to be in a healthy and long-lasting relationship. About the 1800s, Wesley looked around and he witnessed people who were falling in love with God by the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands. After his heartwarming experience in May on Aldersgate Street, he found a new way to preach from his good friend George Whitfield. See, Whitfield discovered that he had an acoustical advantage of preaching outdoors when he would strategically place himself in a certain way and project himself in a certain way. What Whitfield did at that time was revolutionary. He brought the church, instead of staying in the pulpit within four walls, he went outside of the church to the fields where people were who didn't normally go to church. Wesley took this strategy and he began to perfect it. He preached God's love in such an easy and understandable way that people decided and realized that God's love could be for them too. So people began to fall in love with God as if for the very first time. And they became hungry to grow in their faith. And Wesley knew that their initial infatuation would eventually, over time, begin to dissipate. Bishop Reuben Job wrote a wonderful book called Three Simple Rules. Have you heard of this, anybody? Um, the three simple rules Bishop Reuben Job talked about was this. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Kathy Gilbert interviewed Bishop Job about his book when it first came out. And the bishop said this. He said, these simple rules then and now apply to everyone and no one is left out. No one was too good, too mean, too rich, or too poor, too educated, or too illiterate. Drawing parallels between Wesley's time and the world today, Job says the feeling of disenfranchisement 
and doubt and fear are the very same. He said, our world is deeply divided, it's highly cynical about its leadership and greatly dis disappointed in its structures and systems that often seem so flawed and can be broken and corrupt and broadly conflicted and gravely afraid of tomorrow. With so many frightened, hurting people, Job says a radical change must take place. He said, there are two enormously encouraging truths for us to remember. One, God is with us. God continues to woo us, to seek us out, to love us, to speak to us, to enable us, and to lead us into the future. And the second is that God has done this before. Do no harm. It can be hard to face the reality that we can harm others through our actions, our inactions, and even through our indifference. Second point of his, do good. There are many ways that you and I can do good. We can have a conversation with someone about how our community can be a more welcoming place to invite people to add to our faith mosaic with their gifts and graces. We can serve with our hands and our feet and our hearts. There are many ways that we can participate in acts of mercy and justice. Let's take a look at the scripture passage that was read this morning. Paul is challenging the house churches in Philippi to press onward and to seek Christ just as Christ has already took hold of us. The churches and the people in Philippi, they had their challenges, they had their trials, they certainly had their moments of anxiety and doubt. And their one goal was clear in this letter to the people in Philippi, and that goal was rooted in Christ. But their challenge was to stay in love with God every day, not just to rest on their many accomplishments. This is one of the only letter that Paul writes in the New Testament that he doesn't really lambaste the recipients for one reason or another. And this entire letter, all four chapters, is both encouraging and challenging. There's one part of Paul's letter to the people in Philippi that can almost sound like a trumpet charge to keep them going. It says, press, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul knew that things were going well for the people in Philippi, and that is all the more reason for them to focus their sights on the author and perfecter of their faith. In this very same letter, Paul refers to their faith journey as a race that we run. Now, he never says this is a 100-meter dash. This isn't one of those marathon things that you try to get as fast as you can, the first person wins. It's a lifelong race, he says. Not just a speed walk, but it's one that we must pace ourselves as we focus on Christ. So staying in love with God is a choice that we get to make every day. But if we look at ourselves honestly, it's a choice that requires patience and perseverance and honesty. Now, if you've been in any kind of relationship over any decent amount of time, you know that relationships evolve over time. For some, it's as easy as saying thy will be done as a reminder that it's not just about yourself. For others, it's about hobbies, to be able to share in something that someone else loves. But for everyone, relationships require constant attention and care. Staying in love with God requires for us as the person to grow as well. Scripture says that we worship God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yet there is so much that we can learn about who God is, how God loves us, and what our calling for the world is. And it's something that we can't take for granted as a foregone conclusion. You would never say to someone that you love, I love you, then never talk to them again. Relationships take work. And these relationships take a huge investment of our time, and we know that this time can be a worthwhile investment. During our good seasons, my friends, we can experience joy as well. With the weather getting nicer each day, and then getting rainier, and then cold, and then getting nicer, and then getting cold and rainy again, and then just when our hopes are up, it gets rainy again, uh, and then kind of foggy and muggy, um, regardless. It made me think about the concept of joy, because as Bothellites, Seattleites, we talk about the weather as a source of our happiness. It's sunny today, how wonderful. It's raining again. I guess I get to read my book inside. Sunny weather makes me happy. I understand that this feeling of happiness is really a fleeting thing. For example, I love, okay, get your pens and paper out, a good hot fudge sundae with peppermint ice cream with those banana slices just thinly sliced. Perfect. 
when I eat that peppermint ice cream, that hot fudge, and the banana slices, I feel so happy. So much that for some reason, I tip the bowl up and try to get every drop. That's not joy, my friends. Joy, it lingers in my heart. It warms my soul, almost despite anything else that happens around me. So I began searching through the Bible, and I tried to understand what God's joy is for us. Although the word joy appears countless times in the Bible, there are seven passages that talk very distinctly about a very specific kind of joy. The translation is complete joy. What do these verses say about complete joy? Is that God is the only one who can offer us complete joy. In John chapter 3, verse 29, complete joy can be found in your spouse. In Philippians 2, 2, complete joy comes when people are unselfish and they treat one another with love. In Deuteronomy 16, 15, complete joy is found when God blesses the labor of your hands. That one shocked me. Complete joy is found when God blesses the labor of your hands? I always hear people talking about their job as a means to happiness. Working can provide an income, an opportunity for us to engage in the things that we hope will bring us happiness. And this verse suggests that God will bless our work and our harvest, and through it, we may find something better than happiness, and that might be complete joy. But the truth is, for most of us, not many of us are living in complete joy at all. Many of you over the last few months have acknowledged as we prayed together and emailed and spent time over coffee and beverages that you're stressed right now, that work is not making you happy. And maybe no matter what you do, despite the world around you, you just can't seem to find any kind of a happiness no matter how hard you try. Or some of you are very happy right now, most of the time. But would you say that you're experiencing complete joy the way that God intended it for us? Now, I believe there's nothing wrong with wanting to be happy. But in the Christian faith, what Christ offers to us is something so much more rich. There's a God who actually intended for you and I to find and experience complete joy that God has to offer. So how do we find this? How do we accept this? How do we experience this complete joy? According to the book of Romans, we experience the complete joy of God through God's love. According to Paul, we know that nothing can separate us from God's love. More specifically, nothing that we do can separate us from the love of God. Nothing that can be done to us can keep us from experiencing the joy of God that can truly complete us. And this love becomes real to us. We accept it for what it is, as a gift from God. It's one of the reasons why we celebrate communion every first Sunday of the month. It's a reminder that this visible means of invisible grace is something we simply can't earn. But through God's grace, we can accept no matter how hard we try, it's always there available to us. And when we have moments when we can confess that we're stressed, that life can be challenging, God's love can cause us to change our life, the way we view our world, and the way we view the people around us. And I want to hear you to hear me correctly. I'm not saying that when we experience complete joy, that are your job, your relationships, your world, everything all of a sudden magically changes, and everything is perfect and there's no challenges. You know that. Complete joy in Christ doesn't mean that we are completely free from stress or worry or the challenges of the world around us. I believe that we begin to taste the complete joy of God when life is less and less about getting through each day and more and more about savoring the sacred moments as they present themselves. Years ago, I went to Nepal and I spent the summer teaching local pastors with a group of other clergy. We were told to expect that our hosts would want to serve us our meals, and they want to make sure that every one of our needs would be taken care of. I could not have known how true this was. Each day, our kitchen hosts, Shuri and Santos, they woke up two hours before us to prepare our breakfast. We woke up around 6, 6.30 every day. Now, they cleaned our dishes also. They wouldn't let us touch the dishes no matter how hard we tried. And they waited on us, hand and foot, as we tried to train and serve the 46 pastors who become local pastors at the end of our weeks together. After the first few days of our time in Kathmandu, I found a way to spend more time with our wonderful kitchen hosts. At their request, I got to stay up late with them, and they taught me this game called Chasing Tigers. Chasing Tigers is a local board game you can find in Kathmandu. It's a cross between um, chess and checkers. 
One night, Santos just finished destroying me in this game of chasing tigers. By the way, I think we played maybe a hundred times that whole summer. I never beat him once. I love that he never let me win. And I'm not competitive. <laughs> One night, it was about 2 a.m. And he had just beat me for the 12th time in a row. I wanted to give up. I wanted to go to bed. But Santos wanted just one more round, one more game to play. In my mind, I knew I was about to teach in about four and a half hours. I knew he had to wake up in about two and a half hours. So in my exhaustion, I blurted out to him, how is it that you can beat me every single time and still get up several hours before I get up? I'm going to wear you down one day, Santos. I'm going to beat you. Santos never looked up, started resetting the game, and he quickly replied, Pastor DJ, I know that these moments we have together are few, and I want to enjoy every minute. I'll never forget that moment. What if you and I lived our lives interacting with others the same way that Santos did, knowing that our time is too fleeting to stress or to worry, but we have the opportunity to truly enjoy the grace and love and complete joy of God that he offers us. Now, I'm not talking about enjoying every minute as if it were your last. That type of mentality can often lead to regret and unnecessary stress. I'm talking about seeking and striving and working for the joy that only God offers, complete joy. Joy in spite of our difficulties, joy in spite of our circumstances, joy in spite of our troubles. Some of the Psalms are written by King David, and one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 139. I would like to read just a few first few verses to you. This Psalm is entitled, The Inescapable God. David writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You head me in behind me and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high I cannot attain it. This passage in Psalm 139 is so amazing. As a powerful king who ruled over so many people, I doubt that anyone ever questioned David's heart or asked him what his deepest thoughts were. In these first six verses, King David acknowledges that God truly knows his actions, his thoughts, and his words. And as a king, David could surround himself with anyone whom he wanted. He could send anyone away who he did not want to see again. And in these next few verses, he even confesses that God's presence is inescapable. He even says that in Sheol, the unpleasant afterlife, it's within the reach of the ever-present God. And darkness and light, all these things are in the presence of God. And when God offers complete joy, God offers complete joy to where you are this very moment. Successful or lonely, depressed or sad, loved or happy, wherever you are right now, we worship a God who truly offers something beyond our comprehension. I want to be extra clear that joy and happiness are very different things. I believe the difference between the two is the length and the depth of satisfaction. Happiness is an emotion. It's that great hot fudge Sunday that we know the moment the last scoop goes, it'll be done. Joy lasts much longer and deeper. It's a way of living despite our surroundings and despite our circumstances. Complete joy informs our heart. It sets the tone for how we interact with others, with how we work and how we live in our world around us. Happiness depends on what we have, what we can hold, and what we're doing in that very moment. Accepting God's complete joy, it doesn't mean that our lives will suddenly be better but it means that we have the opportunity to shift our perspective. You can be unhappy, but you can still experience the complete joy of Christ. Do you remember I said that joy is in the Bible about seven times, uh, numerous times, but there is only seven times that we can find the complete joy of God? I wonder why this specific phrase only shows up seven times. Why complete joy? Why not total joy or everlasting joy? Because what Christ offers us is a wholeness, a completeness. St. Augustine said that our hearts are forever restless until we rest in God's heart. When we experience the complete joy of God, it fills our hearts deep within. 
Maybe having complete joy makes us want to share it with others. In so many ways, the opposite is incomplete joy. And that isn't joy at all. That's something that we pass off for joy. But in reality, it's a momentary emotion that leaves us wanting more far too soon. Incomplete joy does nothing to speak to the deepest recesses of our hearts. It cannot speak to our faith. It cannot inform us how we interact with others. It's shallow and it's empty. It causes us to look for something else far too quickly, and you and I know that far too well. But complete joy is real. It's something that we can grasp with our hearts. And you know that you're living in complete joy because it begins to permeate every aspect of your life. I have to close with some words from, Mary, uh, from Maya Angelou, who's recently died. These are her words. I've learned that no matter what happens or how bad it seems today, life does go on and it will be better tomorrow. I've learned that you can tell a lot about a person by the way that he or she handles these three things. A rainy day, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas lights. <laughs> I've learned that regardless of your relationship with your parents, you'll miss them when they're gone from your life. I've learned that making a living is not the same thing as making a life. I've learned that life sometimes gives you a second chance. I've learned that you should not go through life with a catcher's mitt on both hands. You need to be able to throw something back. I've learned that whenever I decide something with an open heart, I usually make the right decision. I've learned that every day you should reach out and touch someone. People love a warm hug or just a friendly pat on the back. I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Friends, whether it's through community work, a mission, your work, your play, what you've learned or how you've learned it, or even how you spend your money, may your life and your labor be blessed as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, and as you taste of God's grace, may you begin to savor the complete joy that God offers to each one of us. Amen.